Welcome, everybody. I want to thank all of you for coming to this lecture, lecture series, which was created in honor and memory of my late husband, Will Miller, a social justice activist and professor of philosophy who taught at UVM for 35 years. I also want to thank the board of the lecture series for their work with me in helping to determine topics for these lectures and for their help in finding speakers who are current on the issues that Will would want us to be discussing. The current members of our board are Ann Peterman, Helen Scott, Fred Magdaw, Mike Cassidy, Will Bennington, Ron Jacobs, and myself. We could not do this work without the generous support of people like yourself who have made donations to the lecture series. We hope that you will continue to assist us in keeping Will's legacy alive by making a contribution tonight in the plastic bins which will be passed around to place donations in during the lecture. We also have t-shirts with our logo on them um, for sale, which you can get in the back for $10, which help fund our work as well. Please also sign up on the sign-in sheets that will be passed around so that we can keep in touch with you about upcoming lectures or other events that we support. Interestingly, usually we have the logo up front and I can point to it, but um, somebody with a t-shirt on, could you come up here and stand next to us? Because I'm going to refer, <laughs> model it. Thank you so much. Mind you, you can't see it from the back of the room, but these are the t-shirts with this lovely yo yes. logo. Thank you. Our logo, as our logo for the lecture series says, Will will always be re remembered as a clear voice in a world of false words and disinformation. Our mission, which Will helped to construct, brings speakers to the UVM campus and the Burlington community to provide a continuing program of radical analysis of social, ecological, and political concerns. As many of you who knew him will remember, Will always wore message t-shirts. He used these messages to help start conversations with people and share, and share his point of view about a variety of topics. He never saw a need for a blank t-shirt. More than seven years ago, at our memorial service for him, we hung more than 50 of the t-shirts he wore on a laundry line spread around the balcony at the Unitarian Church to help remind us of the many struggles he worked tirelessly to inform us about. If you look closely at our logo, which is hard to do from wherever you are right now, you'll see specific symbols which represent a variety of the issues that Will spoke about and encouraged others to learn more about. Issues that are all connected with the theme of social justice. Well, all but the last one, which is a sheep. Um, not that we were followers. Uh, that symbol represented a personal passion of his, our small flock of sheep, who, by the way, were all given names of people he and I admired for their political work. Che, Carl, Winnie, Emma, Nelson, etc. <laughs> Will was an amazing social justice activist. When he spoke, we listened. He helped us to understand topics that felt too big to understand. We were incredibly lucky to have Will in our lives for as long as we did. As we say in our mission statement, Will set a courageous example in speaking truth to power. He showed a boundless optimism and a passion for the truth. His voice was powerful, especially in encouraging other voices to speak up and be heard. He had an unwavering commitment to the struggle against war and for social justice, and an amazing ability to move others into action. He was never afraid to speak his mind, put words into action, or place himself on the line, whether it be before the university trustees, on a picket line, at a barricade, or in a congressional office when arrest was imminent. He would be so incredibly proud of the faculty members and students who are continuing to speak out in the name of social justice, both on campus and off. Will offered reasoned and insightful analysis into the origins and workings of capitalism and imperialism, giving us both a call to struggle and a vision of a more just society, a society where all work is valued, where truth is not silenced but nurtured, where all are treated as equals, that, that is at peace with itself and in which neither people nor resources are exploited. 
few years ago, I began, if you're feeling uncomfortable, you don't have to stay, but you're welcome to stay and keep me company. I will stay and keep me company. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I feel stronger already. A few years ago, I began the tradition of reading a favorite poem of ours at the lecture series events. This poem was written by Howard Zinn, another extraordinary social justice activist and university professor who was also greatly missed. It offers us inspiration in trying times. The poem is titled, On Getting Along in Difficult Times, by Howard Zinn. You ask how I managed to stay involved and remain seemingly happy and adjusted to this awful world where the efforts of caring people pale in comparison to those who have power. It's easy. First, don't let those who have power intimidate you. No matter how much power they have, they cannot prevent you from living your life, speaking your mind, thinking independently, having relationships with people as you like. Read Emma Goldman's autobiography, Living My Life. Harassed, even imprisoned by authority, she insisted on living her life, speaking out however she felt. Second, find companions who have your values, your commitments, but who also have a sense of humor. That combination is a necessity. Third, notice how precise is my advice that I can confidently number it the way scientists number things. Understand that the major media will not tell you of the acts of resistance taking place every day, the strikes, protests, the individual acts of courage in the face of authority. Look, and you will certainly find it, for evidence of these unreported acts. And for the little you find, extrapolate from that and assume there must be thousands times as much as you found. Fourth, note that throughout history, people have felt powerless before authority, but that at certain times, these powerless people, by organizing, acting, risking, persisting, have created enough power to change the world around them, even if only a little or briefly. Fifth, remember those who have power and who seem invulnerable are in fact quite vulnerable. Their power depends on the obedience of others. And when those others begin withholding that obedience by defying authority, that power at the top turns out to be very fragile. Generals become powerless when their soldiers refuse to fight. Industrialists become powerless when their workers leave their jobs or occupy the factories. Sixth, when we forget the fragility of power imposed from above, we become astounded when it crumbles in the face of rebellion. We have had many such surprises in our times, both in the United States and in other countries. Seventh, don't look for a, don't look for a moment of total triumph. See it as an ongoing struggle with <coughs> victories and defeats, but consciousness of people growing over the long run. So you need patience, persistence, and you need to understand that even when you don't win, there is fun and fulfillment in the fact that you have been involved with other good people in something worthwhile. Okay, seven pieces of profound advice should be enough. Howard Zinn. I'd like to introduce to you Felicia Cornblue, director, um, director of Women and Gender Studies program and associate professor of history here at the university. She will introduce Frances Fox Piven, who will give our fall lecture. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, everyone, for um, being here. And I'm sorry for those um, who are sitting on the floor. Um, but uh, thank you for sticking it out, however, however uncomfortable. Uh, if we had more chairs, we would gladly give them to you. Um, so this is an honor, and it's really wonderful that everyone is here. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll be quite brief relative to Dr. Piven's uh, accomplishments and the number of things that I could acknowledge her for. 
Um, Dr. Francis Fox Piven, a distinguished professor of political science at the City University of New York Graduate Center in New York City, um, has been justly famous among scholars and activists across the globe for at least 46 years. Uh, she's a person of uncompromising intellect and political commitment. She's authored or co-authored over a dozen books and articles too numerous to mention. She has been president of the Society for the Study of Social Problems and the American Sociological Association, and, and among numerous other awards, um, has received the American Sociological Association's Career Award for the Practice of Sociology, which is a very nice honor considering that she's really a political scientist. <laughs> like me. Um, she and her longtime uh, co-author, Richard Clower, transformed the study of social protest in the United States with their classic work, Poor People's Movements of 1977. They transformed the study of social welfare in the United States with their book, Regulating the Poor, originally published in 1971, and the New Class War of 1982. They transformed the study of voting behavior with Why Americans Don't Vote in 1988. Uh, in addition to those scholarly achievements, P Pippin has also been one of our nation's leading activists to support social movements, to reform the welfare state, and to ensure that more Americans gain access to the vote and the power it grants, at least in theory. She and Cloward have been credited with, among other reforms and changes, the so-called motor voter policies that allow citizens uh, to register to vote when they get or renew their driver's licenses. Uh, it may sound like a small reform, but it was an extremely important one and extremely hard fought. Uh, I first met Dr. Pittman in 1995 when we were lobbying members of Congress in opposition to the legislation that ultimately became the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunities Act of 1996. Uh, the invidious welfare reform, or so-called reform, that ended poor mothers and children's assurance that they would receive help in times of extreme financial need, an assurance that had been in place in the United States since 1935. Piven, a heroine to many women scholars and activists, uh, was one of the people who led us into battle, and we were glad to follow her lead. Francis Fox Piven has recently gained uh, unwanted and unexpected fame from right-wing television commentators and other extremists. Uh, some of you may know. Um, they have misread her work, especially her early work, which analyzed splits in American politics and predicted some of the problems in the American welfare state. Um, they have misread it instead as advocacy of these splits and advocacy of the breakdown of the welfare state, and they have tried to use this misreading to discredit her and to discredit President Obama. Well, uh, the University of Vermont has a message tonight for Glenn Beck and Fox News and other extremist commentators. We don't buy it. <laughs> we are here tonight to honor and learn from one of our most learned and perspicacious analysts of American politics. So let me just end by saying thank you, Dr. Piven, for continuing to be our teacher. I'm glad to be here. Burlington is a legendary place. Uh, hotbed of radicals and anarchists and socialists and movement people, and that's great. <laughs> I'm honored to give a Will Miller lecture, and I'm so pleased that you read Howard Zinn's poem, because Howard was, since I went to Boston University in 1972, uh, he was one of my dearest friends. And I think maybe they were friends, but I think they would have liked each other, Will and Howard, a lot. So uh, thanks for the poem. Thanks for inviting me. And I want to talk about 
what I think was the theme of Will Miller's life and the theme of Howard's telling, which is resistance from the bottom of society and of American society specifically. And the bottom line of my talk is that the only way that we can solve the searing problems in American society is through the welling up of resistance of protest from the bottom of our society. That's the way it has always happened to the extent that our problems have been solved, and that's the way we have to try to make it happen again. But let me begin a little bit further back, uh, telling you what I'm sure you know, which is that we are a very troubled nation. You know, our politicians argue about just how exceptional we are. Well, I'll tell you how exceptional we are. We have the highest levels of inequality of any developed nation, bar none. The highest levels of inequality. We have the highest levels of poverty, including extreme poverty, of any developed nation. We have the highest levels of wealth concentration, and you know, I like the slogan about the 1%, but it's actually the top tenth of the 1% or the top hundredth of 1%. We are a society that our aggregate wealth is pretty good. Yeah, we're rich if we include everybody and we divide it up. But that aggregate wealth, notwithstanding, we are lagging behind other developed nations in the quality of the education we offer to our young people. We charge more for it too when they get to college. Our infrastructure is a scandal. What other countries has bridges falling down or cities flooded as New Orleans was flooded. What other country lets entire cities like Detroit or Camden turn into a shambles? We have the highest levels of incarceration. I think of any country, never mind the developed world, and it may well be that we have the highest levels of corruption, particularly in the financial sector. Our elections even are dogged by scandal. The United Nations has recently appointed a group to come and observe and investigate corruption in American elections. And with the recession, the downturn of 2007-2008, these trends have escalated. They haven't been modified. You know, we think about the Great Depression, the economy collapsed, people were stunned. They rose up, new programs were inaugurated to make things better. Well, in this Great Recession, profits have increased, wages have fallen, it isn't only that we have so many unemployed, it's that those who lose their jobs and gain another job, gain another job at a much lower wage. Well, how can this be remedied? There is a usual view. You learned it in grade school, you learned it in high school, you may even have learned it in college, I hope not, <laughs> but the usual view is that we have to work through our democratic political institutions to solve our problems, and that it can be done. We have to inform ourselves, inform our neighbors, have discussions, <coughs> ring doorbells, pe pull people out to get registered and then to vote. We'll elect the right people, they'll know what we want, what we care about, what bothers us, what our hopes are and problems will be solved. 
Well, that, there's no question that that is a beautiful idea. <laughs> that democracies, you know, democracy, the, the voter is at the very center of the, of the idea of democracy. Voters aggregating uh, parties that aggregate voters will take their pulse, listen to them, reflect their culture, reflect their hopes, and those hopes will be translated into governance. But American electoral politics has never worked that way. Now, it, it's probably worse now, but first look at the very fundamental arrangements that were created by the American Constitution. The idea of democracy, everybody has to vote. All votes are equal. And to be equal, they have to be translated into equal representation, right? In the state capitals or in Washington. But American constitutional arrangements specify, and it's almost inconceivable that we can get it changed, that some votes count much more than others because some voters get to elect greater weight in the Senate. Alaska has two senators, 500,000 people. California has 50 million. California has two senators. Moreover, the inequality in Senate representation is translated into the Electoral College so that representation in electing the president is also unequal. There is no provision in the Constitution guaranteeing the right to vote. And the right to vote has been contested from the beginning of the republic. The right to vote has been contested, particularly in ways that single out minorities, marginalized people. And you know, there's a kind of secret dynamic. Uh, and, uh, maybe it's the bottom side of the glorious dynamic that we talk about, that we have political parties that try to bring people out to vote, and to bring people out to vote, they name candidates that will appeal to those voters, they name their hopes, they name their grievances, they put it all on the platform, and so forth. S some of that happens, but what also happens in American electoral politics, in a two-party <coughs> system, is that parties campaign by marginalizing and isolating the votes of the opposition, and one of the best ways to do that is to disenfranchise them. And that's been going on, again, from the beginning of the Republic. It has especially been going on in the last couple of years in the United States, but maybe I shouldn't say especially because it also happened uh, after the Civil War and Reconstruction. It also happened at the turn of the 20th century when American cities were flooded by immigrants who voted for democratic machines. Republican reformers didn't like that, so they disenfranchised those immigrants. We're, disen we're, we're now at a point in our development, look at this, where demographic change in the United States, a little bit like the turn of the 20th century, we have Lots of immigrants in the country. Lots of them are becoming citizens. Lots of them are Hispanic. We also have a lot of African Americans. Together, the prediction is that we will become a majority minority country in a couple of decades. Now, if the vote is the central element in a democracy, what does that mean? It sounds from my point of view, probably from your point of view, it sounds like a good development, doesn't it? Yeah, maybe we would have a real Democratic Party. Maybe we would have a New Deal type Democratic Party. That could be a good thing. The last several years in which you've been reading stories about vote suppression by state level Republican parties You've been reading stories about the re new requirements, voter ID cards, photo ID cards. You've been reading stories about 
uh, shortening uh, earl the time period for early voting. You've been re reading stories about trying to get rid of or to cut down on absentee ballots. You've been reading stories. Ever hear of True the Vote? True the Vote is a Tea Party group, or it's an offspring of the Tea Party, of the Texas Tea Party. And True the Vote's plan, I think they're exaggerating, but they say that they're going to have a million and a half challengers at the polls on election day. And what do challengers do in the American electoral system? They intimidate would-be voters. That's one thing they do. You know, are you really a citizen? Do you have your voter ID? Where do you, in fact, live? But the other thing they do, which is even more effective, because sometimes people won't be intimidated, is they make the lines longer. They foul up the voting process so that people get exhausted and go home. Well, there are flaws, in other words, in the, even the American electoral system. We have other flaws too. One flaw is the courts, the unelected federal court has recently ruled that unlimited amounts of corporate money can flow into elections and that the people who give those monies or the organizations that give those monies do not have to be identified. From the beginning of the Republic, the courts, the federal courts, have always been understood, they've been understood by the designers of the American Constitution to be a check on democratic majorities. Well, they are acting as a check on democratic majorities right now in this way and in other ways. So elections, I'm not saying that we shouldn't work for elections. I am actually gonna vote for Barack Obama and the Democratic candidates, but I'm not hopeful that that vote is going to reverse the trends that I described. I certainly know the courts are not going to act soon to reverse those trends. And if I try to think about, well, what about reform organizations? Those are interest groups. Don't interest groups have power in American politics? We're always hearing about the lobbyists, the interest groups that warm into Washington, D.C. and swarm into our state capitals as well. Well, yeah, there are some reformers, but come off of it. The interest groups are moneyed interest groups. They are business interest groups. And that's true both on the national level and on the state level. Well, so what are we to do? What have we ever done? I keep saying this has been true for a long time. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. But things have not gotten steadily worse over the hundreds of years that we have been a republic. They have not. Sometimes they're better. So why do they sometimes get better? Why has there sometimes, sometimes there have been periods of reform? periods when our worst problems have been tackled, if not cured. Where do the, where, what forces could possibly emerge in the American political system that would have that capacity? And I think that the answer is that the great force for reform in American political history hasn't come from elections certainly not by themselves. It hasn't come from the courts, and it hasn't come from reform organizations. It has come from protest movements. And this has also been true from the beginning. The American Revolution was a, a kind of hybrid phenomenon, but part of it was what at the time was called the mob. The mob, the revolutionary era mob. Who were the people that you think were recruited into the militia that were willing to go to war with England? It wasn't Samuel Adams. It really wasn't. 
It, was, it wasn't the founding fathers. It was ordinary laborers and dirt farmers who were impassioned because of the idea of radical democracy that was spreading through the country at the time. Now, the idea of radical democracy, I think I could have become a foot soldier in that movement, too. It was, it was, a, it was a good and a developed idea. It wasn't just, we want the vote. Yes, they wanted the vote, but what they wanted were representatives that they could watch over and recall within a year. They wanted a government. When they said close to the people, that wasn't what Richard Nixon meant when he did <laughs> revenue sharing. That was another sort of thing. When they, what they meant by close to the people, they meant close to the people's power, close to the people's ability to monitor what they did and close to the people's ability to kick them out of office. Well, they didn't get that. Uh, they got, but they got something. You know, the House of Representatives has for a long time been called the People's House because if the House of Representatives was constitutionally designed to reflect the aspirations of those people who had fought the Revolutionary War. Because what they wanted, they didn't want what the great merchants and importers and bankers wanted, which was freedom of trade, among other things, and the right to coin their own currency. Uh, what these ordinary people wanted was what ordinary people always want. They wanted a bit of economic security. They were farmers, so they wanted cheap money because they were borrowers. They wanted lower taxes. And they wanted the ability to make their voices heard and felt. Well, the men who wrote the Constitution didn't want that. They wanted to distance government from the sentiments of the radical mobs who fought the war. And to do that, they created a national government at great distance from the dirt farmers who fought the war. And to do that, they limited popular influence on that <coughs> national government. And they were very explicit about it. Just read the federal papers. Nevertheless, something was won. The building blocks, some of the building blocks of electoral democracy were won. At the time, it was, a, it was a partial victory. It really was a partial victory. And you know, in the first decades of the 19th century, that victory was expanded because state level pressures uh, forced the states to begin to eliminate property qualifications, poll taxes, literacy requirements, religious requirements, all of which were intended to shackle the vote. So I count the Revolutionary Era Movement, the Revolutionary War Movement, a partial victory, and I would count each of the great movements in American history as making partial gains, partial that we enjoy, but that get eroded when the movement subsides. Think, for example, about the abolitionists. I don't think we would have had a civil war without the abolitionist movement. There are all sorts of historical arguments about uh, why we might have had a civil war because of sectional conflicts and so forth. But those sectional conflicts over uh, uh, over trade and internal improvements and so on, had been resolved for a very long time. They had been kept under wraps. And the union had held. It was the abolitionists with their incredible oratory. I mean, those people were real pests. 
and they were in the churches, they were in all the Protestant churches, and they were relentless, and they were so self-righteous, and they manned the Underground Railroad that managed to bleed slaves out of the South. Slaves were property, valuable property. And with the Underground Railroad, those, that property was leaving the South. Can you imagine how infuriating that could be? Uh, leaving the South to secede and to trigger uh, the Civil War led by Lincoln in the first instance to hold the Union together, not to free the slaves. That came later during the course of the war when it was made necessary by the fact that the Union Army was not doing very well uh, against the South. Freeing the slaves both deprived the South of, a, of, of its army of labor and also encouraged the freed slaves uh, to join the Union Army, a, a very important resource for the Union. The populist movement that arose in the late 19th century. Oh, I, I should say, but you know that. I mean, the Civil War, one thing, it made us a better society. <clears throat> now, I don't want to say that it solved our racial problem. It didn't. But in the period after the Civil War, the new birth of freedom, the 13th, the 14th, and 15th Amendment, it, it meant a lot to African American people not to be formally enslaved. It's true that the South did many things like the black laws, like imprisoning blacks, like stripping them of the franchise uh, that reduced them to a serf-like population, but still they were not slaves. So it was a partial victory. Or the labor movement. Now, the labor movement struggled for decades in the late 19th, early 20th century. It was a movement that brooked incredible violence, more violent than any European nation's labor movement incurred. But by the 1930s, that movement, through its mass strikes, 1934, 35, 36, 37, and its sit-down strikes, I'd like to bring up the sit-down because I'm a big fan of Occupy. <laughs> At sit-down strikes in the rubber plants, in the automobile plants, it forced FDR to throw his support behind legislation that gave labor the right to organize. That was a victory for labor. Was it complete? Did it hold? Well, it only held partly. There was other legislation like Taft-Hartley, like smith Connolly. There was legislation to erode the gains that were made in 1935, 36, 37. And in recent years, particularly since 1980, the labor movement has been on the defensive. But, you know, a victory for half a century is a victory. And we have to try to recapture it, but it was still a victory of the civil rights movement. Would anyone dare to question whether the civil rights movement was a, made victories for African Americans in this country? Of course it did. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, finally, finally gave African Americans the right to vote, which they had thought they won in 1960, uh, after the Civil War. Well, so all those were achievements, but they were all, and they were all rolled back. None of them were rolled back entirely. They left some residue of reform in their way. Maybe. The last 40 years have been very hard, hard on those historic reforms. The last 40 years have been dominated by business politics, 
you probably don't need me to tell you that. But the consequence has been that many of the reforms won during the New Deal by the labor movement, or the form, reforms won during the Great Society by the black civil rights movement and then the black economic rights movement, many of those reforms have been rolled back. Uh, Felicia mentioned the personal responsibility uh, and uh, personal responsibility work opportunities. and op it does it say economic opportunities? Work opportunities. Oh, work opportunities. opportunities. Reconciliation <laughs> Act. <laughs> anyway, uh, that we worked uh, to defeat, but unsuccessfully. But there's been a lot of uh, legislation rolling back initiatives that were made in the 1930s and 1960s. Uh, at the same time as wages have been lowered, the minimum wage has not kept up with inflation, uh, recurrent efforts to reduce Social Security, some of which have been successful, there will be more of them. And incredible examples of what I can only call capitalist greed, unfettered capitalist greed, itself the result of the rolling back of regulation uh, that occurred under Bill Clinton. The, needless to say, greed is not a good motive for planning for a society. So that to the extent that we let individual capitalists both large corporations and the financial sector run amok. You're going to see the other aspects of our institutions which made collective life possible, tolerable, sometimes even good, are badly damaged. And one aspect of our collective life that has been damaged the most is our climate and our ecology, our planet. How can we not talk about that? I understand that you heard Bill McKibben a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Well, Bill McKibben predicts, as I recall, that within a couple of years, the Earth's average planet will rise by two degrees centigrade. That will likely mean the flooding of islands in the southern uh, tier. It will mean the flooding of coastal areas. It may mean that uh, global warming is irreversible. I mean, this is incalculable. We are doing, they are doing this? Now, that is individual greed or fractures of a society, fractions of a society. Uh, run amok. So the last 40 years have been bad. Yes, we had movements. We made some progress. We were a more humane society by the end of the 1960s than we had been in the 1890s. That's true. Things were better. But with business, on a roll with winner-take-all politics, we needed another movement, a bigger movement. And we waited and we wondered, those of us who thought that, the conditions seemed right. After all, so many poor people, so many people with absolutely unnecessary wealth, what were they gonna do with it? How many houses can you build in Dubai? They won't wanna build in the United States because of what they've done to it. I mean it. Where was the movement? Didn't you ask yourselves that? When you read the statistics, about extreme poverty and extreme wealth, when you read the statistics about the losses that workers had suffered, when you let, read the statistics about the numbers of 
families whose homes were underwater, when you read that student debt had climbed to a trillion dollars, where was the movement? Well, I think it happened. It's here. It came. Movements don't begin with one loud, big cannon burst. They begin with a ricochet of attacks here, protests there. Nobody knows the movement has begun till 50 years later. You can look back and you can <laughs> see. It was the beginning, and it happened here, and it happened there. And it was these sort of bedraggled people and those people with their funny antics. And then it accelerates and it gets bigger. It doesn't go away. It doesn't go away because the problems, the grievances, the broken promises that are fueling the movement don't go away. Moreover, the other thing that fuels a movement and it's very important for all movements all over the world, I think, is when those in authority become illegitimate. Those who are perceived to be in the driver's seat lose honor, lose legitimacy. You know, I think that's happened to the banks, to the financial sector. Those people are thieves. Everybody. Doesn't everybody know it? I think they do. And so finally, actually it began before Occupy. It began with Wisconsin, didn't it? Yeah. And then Occupy. And then everybody said, oh, the authorities cleared the encampments and everybody said, well, Occupy is over. Well, not everybody. Some of us knew it wasn't over. But the press said, oh, I guess it's over. Well, you know, the press said in 1932, there had been some rent riots. There had been some food riots. There had some, been some protests against auctioneers coming to sell off a local farm. Even some protests where the local people had strung up the sheriff in 1932. But that was all. And so in 1932, magazines like the New Yorker pontificated. Well, I guess there's not going to be a revolution after all. I think I'll go back to cultivating my vegetable garden. That's a pretty close paraphrase of that editorial. Uh, they were wrong, completely wrong. Because they thought, well, movements go, Ooh. they don't go like that. They go, whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> uh, and in 1933, there were protests against, uh, protests named themselves uh, bread or wages protests. But by 1934, there were protests outside of the Toledo auto light plant in uh, Ohio, in which the unemployed took over the picket lines because the judges were throwing workers on the picket lines in jail. And by the end of 1934, a general strike was brewing in San Francisco. It escalated, but it didn't happen all at once. Moreover, it didn't happen immediately in the wake of the crisis. The crisis was in 1929. That's when the market fell. That's when unemployment, unemployment soared. And that's when Hoover was president. And Hoover didn't feel compelled to do anything. The protests were not significant enough. Maybe Obama's first term is like Hoover. Maybe his second term will be a term in which the protests grow larger and the president 
finally has forces at his back that he has to pay attention to. Now, Occupy is not yet that movement. Not even Occupy in all its new sort of, it's now sort of uh, morphing into many forms. It's reappearing in strike actions. It's reappearing in student actions, uh, rather than as occupations of little parks. Uh, the, but think how successful, uh, uh, let me begin it this way. All movements have to do two things. They have to communicate their message and their issues, and they have to force their message and their issues into the limelight. They have to force it through all the chatter and the advertisements and the propaganda and the political, the Democratic Convention and the Republican Convention. They have to push their issue. Occupy's issue was extreme inequality. It wasn't just Occupy's issue either. It's a big issue. Lots of us are in the 99%. Occupy got its issue in, into the press, it got it into the Republican convention, and it got it into the Democratic convention. Everybody knows what the 99% is. And everybody knows what it is to occupy. I just read a manuscript called Occupy Political Science. <laughs> uh, so, the movement, I don't know if you want to call it Occupy or not, I'm glad to call it Occupy, but it's gonna be a big movement. And it's gonna be a big, it's gotta do more than communicate. All those other movements in American history, from the revolutionary era mobs, to the abolitionists, to the workers, to the populists, to the anti-war movement, to the feminists, all those movements communicated, but they also did something else, they exercised and they didn't, you know, communication isn't necessarily power. Yes, you can get into the press that way, but the great power of movements, and it's a very distinctive power, is the power of refusal, disruption, resistance. It's the power of the strike in its many, many forms. We can all strike because we all perform roles that are necessary to the functioning of an important institution. Workers go to work, they refuse to go to work, the assembly line stops or the food service stops. That is a strike. If students refuse to go to school, that's a strike too. If city dwellers refuse to obey the traffic rules, that's a strike too. Movements have to discover their strike power, you might say. Or their, what, how do they have the ability to create enough trouble for those in charge that those in charge have to respond to them. And they do have that ability because we all play important roles in very complex, increasingly complex, increasingly extended chains of, you might call it cooperation. Think about the domestic workers in New York. Well, domestic workers in New York, they're almost all immigrants. A lot of them are undocumented. I'm talking about power for the domestic workers in New York. Uh-huh. They play a very important role. They come and they take care of the babies and the homes of the women who then go and preside over a Madison Avenue firm or work on Wall Street or teach at City University. 
Think about a strike of those people who are, in a sense, the lowest of the low, undocumented immigrants, made to work vast hours of overtime. Everybody has some power if they can discover it. Now, Occupy Now is beginning to talk about strike death. This is a very big idea. It's also a very scary idea. Here is what the idea means. Occupy is drawing on the observation, which is correct, that tens of millions of Americans have been ensnared in debt by aggressive credit card companies. How many advertisements for credit cards did you get last year? They want you to take out more and more because their interest rates and their fees make them so much money. And they're gonna get that money from you. Or the students who, net, who have borrowed a trillion dollars, their families have co-signed those debts. Or the 15 million or so homeowners who are underwater. Or the local governments that are indebted to the banks. And the local special districts who have floated bonds that the banks have bought up. And charge high fees for and then used, do you remember the Libor scandal? And then fix the interest rates so that the banks would make more money. Well, Occupy is trying to figure out how they can activate, or they together with other organizations in formation, can activate something very fundamental, a fundamental kind of power. You know, we sort of learn that power depends on resources, that rich people have a lot of power, and uh, generals that can call on their troops have a lot of power, and that people who preside over big institutions like Citigroup or Chase or uh, the University of Vermont have a lot of power. That's, that's what we usually think. And we're, looks like, the way life unfolds, it looks as though they do most of the time. But you know, sometimes, this is the occasional thing, sometimes people discover that they have sources of power over the president of the University of Vermont or over Chase Bank or over General Motors, or over Boeing. And that power is, has to do with the fact that what they do is critical to Boeing, or to Chase, or to the university. What they do in their ordinary roles is absolutely necessary for those in charge to stay in charge and for the institution to continue to function. The Wobblies used to have a song. It is, we who plowed the prairies, built the cities where they trade, laid the railroads, and oh, and something, something, endless miles of railroad laid. I should have reviewed the song before I came. Uh, the, what, what is the message in those words? It's, we did it. They need us. We have to discover the different ways in which they need us. And we can refuse. We can strike. Because the future of the country, and maybe the future of the planet, really does depend on us. Thank you.
Everybody agrees with me. I'm not sure I heard everything you said. Um, oh, yeah, that was great. Yeah, and I, um, absolutely. The, I said that movements are interrupted. They kind of have a staccato pattern rather than swinging up in a great arc. Uh, but don't forget, UK uncut. Uh, and the Spanish indignados, uh, the victory of the Quebec students uh, was stunning, and they actually won. They won outright. Uh, the Chilean students, uh, the, there's a big struggle in Mexico uh, right now, and I don't think this is an American movement. This is rather the American branch of an international movement against neoliberal capitalism. many state legislatures. I mean, this is, but it, to the extent that we can pe put people into authority who also depend on the people that are mobilized by the movements, that stays the hand of the state. That stays the repressive hand of the state. Why do you think FDR refused to do what presidents had always done in American history, refused to send the army to dislodge the sit-down strikers in Flint, Michigan. They were absolutely keen to his own recovery plans, but he did not do it. 
They were his voters. And we, we need to have at least that much protection. So, uh, I think you should vote November 6th. I'm not saying you should work on the election, you should vote. Uh, yeah, but uh, Vermont seems to have a passion for the local, uh, that if it can't influence the larger nation and the world, and there's some good arguments that we can, at least we make Vermont into a kind of a paradigm, kind of a model, a uh, kind of an experimental lab to discover, rediscover democracy. What do you think of that idea? Well, I think you should go ahead and do that. Uh, uh, but along the way, give what support you have to those of us who are left out in the cold and are trying to make things a little bit better for New York, the nation, and the world. <laughs> I'm going to vote. I'm not going to tell you who I'm going to vote for. It's not going to be a Democrat or a Republican. It's just going to get. Question. Yeah, how do you how do you respond to that? I mean, Romney gets in power, it's going to get worse, faster, and it's going to improve the. No, I don't population. believe in that. I really don't believe in that. I don't necessarily think that when things are worse, the people will rise and things will therefore be better. I can give you so many historical instances where, when things got worse, the people were crushed for a very long time. So. I want things to get better. And I think things getting better sometimes gives people hope and courage and encourages activism. I would be glad to debate anybody about which historical instances are more numerous. Those when things got worse and people rose up or things got better and people rose up. The big part, the big actions in the 1930s did follow a depression but it was when the depression, well, the clouds of the depression were lifting that people rose up in large numbers. So, anyway, I don't want to take a chance. I think it's. I'm wondering about uh, two particular movements that have taken over the country. Uh, one is Alec. And the other is Lockheed Martin. Where do we get a hold on that? Because they're so huge. Yeah, they are. I, Alec took everybody by surprise. Uh, except some friends of mine were very aware of it. Joe Rogers was talking about it, has been talking about it for 20 years. You know what, what, they, what they did. Uh, it, it, it's a corporate political organization which concentrates on state legislators and getting state legislation through. And it forms local chapters which include corporate heads and state legislators. State legislators pay much lower dues than the corporate members and together they uh, plan vacations, they cavort on the beach and they uh, and they uh, have model legislation. The voter suppression laws that were passed over the last couple of years were planned by ALEC. In area after area, the anti-collective bar, the laws that strip public workers of collective bargaining rights were planned by ALEC. 
and you know there are these these legislators who are in the clubs are like seeds because they they spread this poison and then after 2010 enormous amounts of money were poured by corporations into the 2010 midterm election the crowds of young people and minorities who were so heady with excitement in 2008. How can you be so excited about a midterm election? No, they didn't turn out. So Republicans swept the state races and Alec moved in. Is it a movement? I would call it an organized conspiracy, not a movement. I mean, you, I think you, you have to try to create enough popular power to resist them, uh, to resist the pressures of the defense industry for more defense spending. Well, when can we do that? We can do that when we have countervailing pressure uh, with, backed up, I think, by movements for spending on the things Americans need, like schooling. I mean, we, we need it now, but we, that need isn't translated into a political force, a political force that will not easily be appeased. We have to make, in a sense, civil order, civil peace, something they have to paid for by cutting defense spending, raising taxes on the banks, re-regulating the banks. Someday I want to take them over. Organization, if not those things. 
Uh, so, so I th what I'm what I'm asking for is a reevaluation of our old models of organization, uh, out of empathy with and appreciation for what has been accomplished by the movements that disavow that kind of organization. Do you want to quarrel with SNCC? You're not quiet about what it did? Do you want to quarrel with the global justice movement, with the environmental movement? All those movements tried hard to avoid the pitfalls that have been created by the old communist, socialist, and social democratic organizational forms. I might also point out that those organizational forms espouse a program and an ideology which depended on economic growth. It, wasn't, it isn't only capitalism that believes in growth. Those old left political formations believed in growth too. We have to reevaluate that. Well, we need more people to rise up and uh, have, have a, a risen already. Yeah, of course we need more people because we have powerful enemies. Are the conditions right? I hope so. Uh, we have to wait and see. I've always been struck by how quickly, how transforming a movement itself is, movement and participation in a movement really is. Uh, you know, in the 1930s, uh, when that New Yorker editor, uh, editorial writer, was saying that, you know, I'm going to go back and cultivate my garden. There's not going to be any revolution in the United States. Uh, other writers were writing about how workers were hiding the fact of their unemployment. Uh, and pretending to go to work in the morning so that the neighbors would not know, swinging their lunch boxes, even though the lunch boxes were empty. Uh, but when protests began, that shame could, not for everybody, but for a lot of people, that shame was rapidly transformed into anger. So, you know, we, we don't really know who our allies are out there. Who are the possible foot soldiers in the movement that the United States so desperately need? We have to try and find out. And one way to find out is not to go around and ask them to sign up and pay a membership fee but it's to create the actions which allow them, allow people who, like the debtors, you know, think of how we think of a debtor. A debtor is a little guy, right? Very shame, doesn't want to hold up his head. He doesn't want you to know that he's got a debt. A striker, on the other hand, is a big guy, very bold, <laughs> very proud. Well. Uh, I think we've got to give debtors the opportunity to be bold and proud, too. I think everybody wants to be bold and proud. And movement participation is one way that people are transformed. Um, that's a lot of work we do here in the university and some of the work 
affect uh, intellectuals and writers and uh, uh, students and thinkers can do. Um, so, I mean, that's, I think that's part of our work. that it can do what, the Democrats? Just that you have any hope in the Democratic Party at all. Why do you well, you know, let's begin by saying either the Democrats are going to win or the Republicans are going to win. So it's not a question of my love for the Democrats or my, uh, one or the other of them, either Romney's going to win or Obama's going to win. Uh, given those choices, I mean, I know there's, there's some third party candidates out there, but they, they're not going to win. Uh, although, you know, sometimes they can steal an election from somebody who could win, but I don't want to get into that now. Uh, but all I'm saying is that Obama, if, if, if this is in fact the beginning of a period of mass protest, Obama, preferably with a Democratic Congress, the House is impossible, at least a Democratic Senate, Obama would be a better person to have in charge. And the reason is that the movement, the movement, when, first, no, let me go back a step. The movement first has to survive. And to survive, we have to try to put a block on the repressive capacities of the state. And who's going to hesitate more to call out the troops? Obama or Romney? What about the NDAA? Who does that? Obama. What? The NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, that could lift any of us off to Guantanamo. I'm not saying, no, you're missing the, I, I think you're missing my point at least. My point is not that Obama is good. Not that in all, whatever that is. Not that he will, I mean, he's, he, he, he is behind the drone attacks. I know that. He is, he assassinated, he called for the assassination of Osama. I'm not saying he is a, it's not an argument that he is a gentle and a good man. <laughs> it's an argument that it would be politically more costly for him to do it and that, to call out the troops against protesters and therefore, therefore, he will hesitate more than Romney will. Romney would just get points for doing it. Or look at it another way. In 2003, we had, I think, what was probably the largest movement mobilization in American history. Certainly, it was the largest anti-war mobilization against Bush's war in Iraq. It seemed to have no impact on the administration. I think that is because Bush did not depend on any of the people who were in the anti-war demonstrations. There was no sort of overlapping uh, exposure. But, so it's a strategy question. It's not a question of giving medals to some people for being anti-violent or non-violent. Well, I strongly disagree with that, but I do thank you for your kind words about Thank you for the invitation. I'll try to do that. You know, I've been, uh, it's not my question, but debating the same issue, but you have convinced me uh, of the strategic importance of casting that vote. I wasn't going to vote for anybody as a protest, but I 
think there's some merit to your logic, uh, and, and I take that to heart. One thing I'd like to uh, ask you to comment on is those of us that remain, we're a core, okay, to some extent. We need to empower ourselves. I'd like to ask you to comment on the personal perspective of this. We need to empower ourselves with a commitment to be equal or greater to what those soldiers did, those citizens did in the American Revolution. Because if we don't, the power of empire, imperialist empire, that's come to the shores of America is so large, okay, uh, uh, you know, I, I hate to say it, it, it's hard to have hope. But then there are people like me who don't need hope, okay? My measure of success is if, if, if they do me in, okay? I'll be darned if I'm gonna give up the core values of the Constitution I believe in. So we all need to come to a commitment within ourselves that powers us and then put people like us in power. Until you get people like us in power, okay, their power will, 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 be, will be endless. And so we have to, regardless of hope, have that determination and that willpower and that commitment. Well, the problem is that people like us, once they're in power, are not like us anymore. <laughs> and that is a real problem. Uh, and again, the examples are legion, uh, and they occur in every quarter, in every walk of life. Union leaders who have biographies of being great rank and file Democrats rise to the presidency of the union and end up taking four salaries. So uh, we always have to be vigilant against people and, and against too. Vigilant and skeptical of people in power. I think your question. All movements are not progressive, radical, left, transformational. We also have reactionary, reactive, uh, destructive movements. And we've had a lot of them in American history. And we have a very important one that is alive and well in the United States today, and it's called the Tea Party. I said earlier that the Tea Party had spun off these groups that call themselves True the Vote, that are determined to stop as many Hispanics and African Americans as they can from voting in the coming elections. Uh, so what about that Tea Party? Uh, or what about the white citizens movement that arose during the Civil Rights Movement? Or what about the Southern Redemption Movement that arose during and after Reconstruction in the South? Well, the Tea Party, is, I said movements from the bottom of American society. The Tea Party does not come from the bottom of American society. We should be clear about that. I think a lot of left commentators have been confused about that. There is data on who they are in class and demographic terms. They are 93% white. They are old, relatively old. They're 60-ish. Uh, 
Uh, I can say that because I'm even older. Uh, the, they are better off than other people. They are not financially stressed at all. They're on the edge of retirement. You, you know that crazy scream that went up from Tea Party is, don't let government get its hands on my Medicare? <laughs> well, they really like Medicare. I mean, they get a, a lot out of Social Security and Medicare. So, I mean, there's a certain, they don't understand American public policies, it's true. But most people don't understand American public policies, partly because they're not designed to be transparent and clear. But, and so all that is, I can document. But I want to say more about them, something more, something that is maybe a little bit less obvious. I've been to Tea Party rallies. They have a chant at their rallies. And the chant is, take it back, take it back, take it back, take it back. What are they talking about? They're talking about taking the country back because it belongs to them and taking it back from those black and brown people, but taking it back also from the sort of the, the, the youth culture and the sexual changes that were, and family mores changes that were introduced by the 19, by, by young people from the 1960s on. That is so upsetting to them. And I, you can understand it, can't you understand it? I mean, they live in a world where they, I mean, a man is a man, and a woman is a woman, and uh, don't get that confused. That's very anxiety producing. And they live in a world where, in their imagination at least, everybody lives in a little white house around a little church with a white steeple. And, and those people are destroying that world. Well, you know, that world is going. It's gone. It never was there, in fact. Uh, but that may, th these, these are authentic characteristics of this movement. And these authentic characteristics lead to anxieties, which make the movement very susceptible to the machinations of groups like Americans for Prosperity, to the Koch brothers, to the Karl Rhodes of the world, who it's really for the last 35 years that right-wing operatives have been taking advantage of the anxieties and vulnerabilities of small town white America, anxieties and vulnerabilities provoked by the rise of blacks, now the rise of Latinos, the rise of gays and lesbians, the rise of women. They've been taking advantage of those anxieties to build a base for big money. 